Welcome back to RM Transit, and a very special episode where I demystify one of the greatest mysteries in the world of trains, and how three very special types of trains on three very different train systems break the mold. How do trains turn? If you're not already, consider supporting the channel on Patreon or via YouTube memberships. You get early access to videos, access to special exclusive chats with me and other patrons and supporters, and to help me upgrade from eating instant ramen to craft dinner. Just kidding, craft dinner is not an upgrade from instant ramen. Now, before I talk about how trains turn, you may be asking, well, why does this even matter? I think a lot of technology out there goes deeply underappreciated, and railways and trains are actually among the greatest victims of this. Sure, trains are not jet engines or microprocessors, but a ton of engineering has actually gone into them over the past over century that trains have existed. So why is getting a train to turn so complicated? Well, there are a number of reasons. For one, trains are not cars, and so their wheels do not turn independently of the bogies, which are the structures that the wheels are mounted on. For two, train wheels are usually linked together, which means that they spin at the same rate, which also is different from how cars work. Now, if you know anything about wheel systems, vehicles, and that sort of thing, you'll know that one of the ways you can get a vehicle to turn is by having the two wheels spin at different rates. Essentially, when the two wheels spin at different rates, the wheel on the inside of the curve spins slightly slower than the wheel on the outside. And what this means is that the wheel on the outside moves forward faster than the wheel on the inside, and that gives you a turn. Trains don't work this way for complex technical reasons that I really can't get into in this video. Now, the solution that engineers over the years found to this problem is incredibly elegant. Instead of having wheels on either side of the train spin at different rates to turn the train, on a train, the wheels on both the inside and the outside of a curve cover different distances with each wheel rotation, causing them to turn. But how does that work? Well, as it turns out, one set of wheels is actually larger than the other set. That way, when a train turns, the wheels on the outside of the turn, the larger wheels, are able to cover more distance with the same number of turns, creating that lovely curving motion. Now this may sound really odd, and if it sounds odd to you, you're paying attention. If one set of wheels on a train is larger than the other, then how does the train turn in the other direction? That seems really problematic, right? The answer? Trains have several sets of wheels on each side. This way, the wheel used corresponds to both the direction and the steepness of a curve. Basically, whichever direction you're turning, the outer wheel will be larger than the inner wheel, and the steeper or tighter the curve, the larger the difference between the inner wheel and the outer wheel. Now you might be asking, how is it possible that you have several sets of wheels, and can you explain how that works? A way of simplifying this concept is to compare wheels to cones, because yes, train wheels are actually conical, which means they form a portion of a cone. This is how most train wheels actually work. Most. What this means is that when taking a corner, trains wheels have a nearly infinite number of options for what wheel size to use. These different sizes correspond with different positionings along the wheels themselves, which, as they are cones, have different sizes. Further discussion of the wheel profile probably is going to involve some advanced geometry and calculus, and while I would enjoy that, you probably won't, so let's move on. Codes are good and all, but how do the wheels actually get into the right position? The answer is every physicist's best friend, inertia. When something moves in a curved motion, it naturally wants to travel perpendicular to that direction, which is how the train wheels are pulled into the correct position to turn correctly. Now, I'm sure you came here to hear about unconventional trains, right? So let's discuss those. Generally, trains' wheels have a pretty typical cone angle, which we could call X. Again, I'm simplifying a lot here. Train wheels aren't actually perfectly cone-shaped, they have varying profiles which are adapted to different railway systems and uses. Wheels are also reprofiled and shaved down over their lifetimes to maintain their reliability and performance, much like how you would inflate a car or bike tire to keep it in peak performance. Now, the Docklands Light Railway, or DLR in London, which I talked about up here, is very unique in that the wheels on its trains are much more cone-shaped than usual. We could exaggerate this and say they have a slope of 1.5x. The reason they have such a steep slope? It's much more suited to the tight curves on the DLR network. 
Those tight curves mean that the outer wheel going through a corner often needs to be much more different in size than the inner wheel, and this is why the cone profile on the DLR train's wheels is so steep. You just don't need those angles for a standard mainline train. As it turns out, the Vancouver Skytrain, you know I had to do it, also has a very similar wheel profile because it too is a light metro that has a lot of steep corners. The Vancouver Skytrain's wheels are unique in other ways because of its use of linear induction motors, but I'll save that for a future video. There's actually another unique element to the way the wheels work on the Vancouver Skytrain that does pertain to curves though, and that's that unlike basically every other type of train in the world, the Vancouver Skytrain has what's called steerable bogies, which counters what I talked about at the beginning of the video, do steer basically like car wheels. Essentially, a standard bogie is rigid. The wheels at both one end and the other stay parallel to one another. On a steerable bogie, the center of the bogie can pivot, and so the wheels at one end of the bogie can be out of alignment with the wheels at the other end. What this means is that when traveling through a corner, the wheels can remain parallel to the rails. This is useful for improving performance through curves and reducing noise because the wheels don't need to slip as much, something that does have to happen more on other bogey designs. Steerable bogies are one of those things that, like the linear induction motors on the Skytrain, have their benefits, but like a lot of other features of the Skytrain, those benefits are questionable, and the extra technical complexity is part of why they haven't really been widely implemented. Unfortunately though, these steep conical wheels of both the DLR and the Skytrain come with a curse, and that curse is called hunting. Hunting is actually just a general term that can be used for a variety of different phenomena. Basically, to simplify, the effect of hunting is when some sort of force is trying to find a center point. In the same way, it happens with train wheels at high speeds, and it happens more prominently when your train wheels are more cone-shaped. It's sort of natural when you think about it because the cone shape of the wheels sort of creates this instability. The slope is steep enough that the wheels can sort of slide back and forth, and as they move faster and faster, you tend to see this hunting effect more severely. It's something I personally really notice on the Scarborough RT in Toronto. When it starts picking up speed, it tends to jostle back and forth as the wheels try to find a center point on the rails, and this is part of what limits the top speed of systems like the DLR and the Skytrain. As it turns out though, this instability has a solution, or many, but one solution I'm going to talk about in this video. It's implemented on many trains around the world, notably among them the Shinkansen bullet trains in Japan, which have drum style wheels. Such wheels are shaped like drums, though again, I'm being generous here, they're not actually perfectly drum shaped, you get the point. Essentially, we could say the slope of a drum style wheel is like 0.25x, one quarter x. It's very flat. Just looking at the way the wheels sit on rails, you can see how this would be more stable. There just isn't as much slope for the wheels to climb up onto. This style of wheels massively improves stability, especially at high speeds, but it comes with a cost. Rails and wheels of this style tend to be more expensive to maintain, and trains on such flat wheels cannot turn very well because there isn't much difference in wheel size from one part to another. This is okay for the Shinkansen because it already has incredibly long turns because of its high speeds. Of course, like all great technical solutions to a very specific problem, another transit system that absolutely didn't need it picked up this technical solution and ran with it. BART. At the time BART was being planned, designers who were clearly going for a space age vibe with unconventional looking trains, unconventional electrical systems, a lot of unconventional stuff, decided to make the wheels an incredibly flat profile because they believed that this along with the wide gauge that is the same as the gauge used on mainline trains in India, would lead to an incredibly fast and stable ride. Now they weren't entirely wrong. BART's trains under the right conditions can be quite stable. That said, this adoption of a technology they didn't really need to use because it seemed modern feels very familiar. There's this trend in transit of, of using a certain technology that you don't really need to use, but you use it because it's trendy or it seems technically better or because it has good branding behind it, even when the older solution would probably be better anyways. It reminds me a lot of gadget bonds. Should I make a dedicated video on gadget bonds? Let me know in the comments down below. So yes, while well, BART's engineers were patting themselves on the back because the trains are great when they're going straight, the second a BART train hits a poorly maintained section of track, or God forbid, a corner, the trains make an incredibly terrible, terrible ear-piercing sound. The sound is so bad that in fact, sound samples were taken from BART and used in one of the most famous horror video games of all time. That might be a sign you missed the mark. Now, with all of that said, does any of this actually really matter? Yes. Understanding the vehicles we use on transit and railway systems is incredibly important, and it's something we have way underemphasized in recent years. 
The example of the Ottawa LRT shows you that not only can a bad technical solution disrupt service, but it could actually undermine transit in your city as a whole. And that is something we just don't want. Of course, just generally having a sense of how things work is incredibly valuable. Mental models are something that I really want to emphasize more on this channel in the future. And the ideas around how your wheels are shaped, how your bogies work, how your trains go around corners. These things are important when we're thinking about different transit systems, railway or not. So thanks for watching today's video, and I hope you learned something about trains, engineering, and corners. Leave a comment down below on what topic you think I should cover next. I'll see you in the next one.